Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Kristen Schilt. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at the University of Chicago. And this is the second of our series this year on virtual panel discussions that are revisiting key themes from the 1973 special issue in the American Journal of Sociology about the status of women. Today, we are focusing on the sociology of work and intersectional lens. And on February 20th, we'll have our third series on um, abortion access and reproductive justice after Dobbs. Uh, so we'll drop a link in the chat and you can all um, sign up if you're interested. I'm going to introduce our speakers today and then turn it over to our moderator to start our discussion. So we'll talk for about 45 minutes and then we're going to open up the floor to um, participants, which means we're gonna ask you to put your question in the chat and then we will field some audience questions. So thank you so much for joining us today. So if all of our panelists wanna turn on their videos, that would be great. And I'm gonna go alphabetically through our panelists. So we have Margaret Chin, who's a professor of sociology at Hunter College and the CUNY Graduate Center. And most recently, she's the author of Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. We have Christine Williams, professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin, who just recently published Gaslighted, How the Oil and Gas Industry Shortchanges Women Scientists. Uh, Dia Harvey Wingfield, who's a professor of sociology at Washington University at St. Louis, and also the vice dean of faculty development and diversity, uh, and is the author of Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in This New Economy. And our moderator is Sigrid Lure, who is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Illinois, Chicago, who's working on a book project related to her dissertation, which was titled Engineering Inequality, Rethinking Inclusion in the San Francisco Bay Area Tech Industry. So thank you so much for joining us and I'll hand this over to Sigrid. Great, thanks so much, Kristen, for that introduction. And it really is such an honor to be moderating this panel tonight. And as a reminder, we will be taking questions from the audience at the end. So feel free to keep those in mind as we're talking today. So to start us off, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about their most recent book. And Adia, I will kick it over to you first to get us started. Great, thank you so much. And thanks to Kristen for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk with everyone about this topic. Um, so my last book, Flatlining, Race, Work and Healthcare in the New Economy is a study of how the way that work is changing is having an impact on black professionals. Specifically, I wanted to think more broadly about how uh, economic and cultural changes that we see happening in the way that we work writ large um, we're having an impact on the way that Black professionals are navigating kind of this new work world. And I was influenced a lot by thinking about the work of some of the people on this panel and thinking more broadly about how uh, the picture that we have of how work occurs is really a very outdated one in many, many ways that we no longer have this model of people just working for this one company for the duration of their careers and retiring from that company or even being able to count on upward mobility in that company. But at the same time that that paradigm has shifted, we've also seen more um, openness to organizations, at least saying that they prioritize diversity and that that's something that they value, even that we know that simultaneously the types of supports for work have really shifted and become a lot less certain than they have been in, in the past. So I wanted to think about what it meant for Black workers to enter this workspace where access to work has become a lot more tenuous than it had been, even at the same time that organizations are saying that they value more diversity and want more Black workers, even as work itself has become a lot more uncertain. And so that was what led to flatlining and the research that is embodied there. Christine, would you like to go next for us? Sure. Um, my latest book is Gaslighted, How the Oil and Gas Industry Shortchanges Women Scientists. And it tries to explain um, why this industry is so male dominated. It is like the worst industry in the world in terms of gender inequality. And I wanted to figure out why. And um, Basically, it's an industry that only hires white women and then fires them whenever the price of oil goes down. And 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 that's something I figured out after 10 years of research. I did some longitudinal uh, interviewing uh, to find out how this happened. And uh, 
I call the book gaslighting, uh, gaslighted because just like Adia, this is happening in a context where workplaces are saying, or at least claiming to care about diversity. And yet year after year, we see the exact same result that these companies reset the diversity needle to zero every time the price of oil falls. So that's what that book's about. And hi, I guess I'm going next. Um, thank you again, uh, Kristen and Sigrid for inviting us, inviting me. I feel very honored to be here with Adia and Christine. Um, so anyway, so Steph, why Asian Americans don't reach the top of the corporate ladder? Well, I wrote this book because Asian Americans are rarely studied in, uh, in the workplace. And people just assume that Asian Americans had no trouble getting uh, to the top of corporations because they don't seem to have any problems getting into school and getting their foot in the door in these corporations. So it just seemed like they were all doing okay. But some stats show that, you know, in um, the stats in the S&P 500 in 2022, there are only 42 Asian American CEOs, eight black, 22 Latino, and 37 corporations are led by women. So that means that over 86% or 85% of corporations are led by white men. So very small portion of we're talking about uh, diversity and DEI um, are led by any, anybody else but white men. So I looked at uh, finance, law, media, tech, not the engineering part of tech. I interviewed 103 Asian Americans from all backgrounds, East Asian, South Asian, um, Southeast Asian and the Indian subcontinent, but uh, everyone I interviewed were American born or American raised because I wanted to hold language constant and they all reported that they had difficulties moving up every single one of them. And so they all thought that it was their own individual problem that they all had individual problems with maybe their coworkers or their um, supervisors or managers, but in effect because they're all saying the same story it's really systemic. And that's something that I think most people have not even realized, or it never occurred to them that it was organizational and it was systemic racism going on. So, and I think part of it is that racism, as we know it, comes out differently for Asian Americans, you know, because they don't, Asian Americans aren't white, they're not Latino, and they're definitely not Black. And what a lot of Asian Americans will say is that, but we don't have racism like it's for like the way they treat African Americans or black Americans in this country. We're not, you know, treated the same way by the police. We're not treated the same way, you know, in schools. We're not, so it, so it, we may, must not face racism, but in fact they do. So, you know, I also looked at women and how um, stereotypes affect them, but I'll get into that later, you know, a little bit later, but that's what the book is all about. Great, thanks. And I'm sure you'll all share some examples from your books as we continue the conversation a little bit. Now, today our panel is revisiting some of the main themes from the AJS special issue on the status of women. So my next question is, what do you see as some of the main insights from this 1973 issue? And what are some of the major shifts in how we study workplaces today? And so in particular, you might think about how our approaches to gender and race have changed since the 1970s. And so Christine, we'll start it off with you and then maybe go to Margaret and then Adia for this question. Okay, happy to answer this question. And I have a copy of the book. Uh, well, it was an issue of the journal and then it was published again as a book. And I actually got this in graduate school and I paid probably a dollar fifty at most for it for, for it. So I'm I'm very happy to see the images uh, being used on the posters. Uh, very cool work there on Kristen's part in the in the center. So um, I reread it, uh, very interesting. The first thing I noticed uh, was how angry many of the authors are. They are completely exasperated by men's blatant sexism. Um, it's clear from the opening essay by editor Joan Huber, who presents a typology of sexist sociologists. Totally precious. Everybody must read this. It's not very often that we get to see this kind of anger expressed in the American Journal of Sociology. Now, the main complaint of these authors is that women are almost completely ignored in sociological research and theory. This is what led Jesse Bernard to refer to sociology as the science of male society. 
The only time women ever appear in sociology texts is as wives and mothers. It's only in the context of family that we'll ever see anything about women. The other thing that strikes me about these articles is that they reflect the dominant structural functionalism at the time. They, don't, they didn't have the benefits of concepts like intersectionality or hegemonic masculinity or heteronormativity or even gender for that matter. The concept is completely missing from this issue. Instead, the authors write about sex roles and role strain. For example, a number of the articles discuss the possibility that the housewife role makes women mentally ill. And this becomes the basis for arguing that women should then join the paid labor force. And this is the third thing that I find striking about these articles. There's a consensus that women's labor force participation is key to women's liberation. They don't consider the possibility that paid employment might make women mentally ill. <laughs> I'm struck by the optimism they express about the job market. Granted, this is in the early 1970s. It's an era of widespread prosperity and uh, anti-discrimination laws are coming in all over the place and they're relatively new. So there was a lot of hope at the time that women would soon be sharing in the advantages of employment, which previously were only enjoyed by men. So what's missing from these articles? Well, the vantage point is almost exclusively that of white women. With rare exception, there's nothing in here about racism or white supremacy. Most of these articles lack a critique of capitalism and the feminization of poverty. Nothing is said about sexual harassment or domestic violence. And these were all topics that were addressed by the women's liberation movement at the time, but they aren't here. And that, I find that very curious. Uh, why were these topics missing? I mean, Ms. Magazine debuted in 1972, Our Bodies, Ourselves, 1970. Um, obviously, the anti-war movement was still going on. Uh, the Black Panthers were active. I mean, this was a period when all of these concepts were being discussed by the larger women's movement. So I'm, I'm curious about why they were missing. I noticed that the authors are all, almost all, either assistant professors or graduate students who are in this issue. And I wonder how much that constrained them. I'm sure they all knew about socialist feminism and Black liberation struggles, uh, but they also wanted tenure and jobs. Uh, so I wonder uh, if they were just trying to find a way to critique the science of male society without upsetting any mainstream paradigm. Even so, I find it paradoxical that at the same time they're, that they're demanding to be let in, you know, look at me, I want to be part of the sociological repertoire. Uh, they don't notice how they're privileging the concerns of middle class white women. Uh, it makes me wonder if anything was left on the editing room floor. Uh, maybe Kristen can go find some archives for us to explore. So I'll leave that question there. So Christine, you're pretty thorough there. So I think, um, you know, the, the main things I want to add is that, yeah, while they even, you know, I mean, you're definitely right on, on everything, you're on target. And especially with leaving out um, uh, women of color, I also think they left out working class women too, of any color, right? And I think that is where um, when, when they left them out, you don't hear about the part in family where there's a double burden because those women have always worked, right? And you don't see or, or at least feel the women who might, um, they're not devoting their uh, lives to uh, furthering their husband's, their spouse's career, but they actually have a career and they have a career because it's just for material needs. And that's a double burden that we don't see. And we don't see the double burden in terms of the additional work that she has to do at home. You know, So that's the stuff that's missing. And I know at that time, those women who wrote these articles knew about this. There's no way that they could not have known about working class women um, in general. Um, and of course, as, um, 
as we probably all know, it wasn't intersectional at all. They never balanced out or looked at how relationships might have affected this, even relationships with women. Because some of these women, I'm sure, were probably had um, caregivers of color as well. And what's the relationship between the women there? So I think, um, I think I'll stop there. So a lot of the insights, I think, um, that, um, that they may need to get to or that we should get to too, is that they, they brought uh, their relationship, the spousal, the spousal relationship, um, then they talked about it, but they need to kind of expand on that, um, expand on it in terms of the different kinds of women um, and the different kinds of relationships that they might've had. Um, and in fact, um, probably expanded on the different kinds of um, jobs outside of the professions. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'll turn it over to Dia. Thank you. So yeah, these are such thoughtful comments and they're along the lines of what my thinking was in reviewing this, this art, this edition. I want to actually drill down a little bit onto one particular article that I think really encapsulates what Christine and Margaret have been talking about. And uh, probably unsurprisingly, it's the Epstein piece, the positive effects of the multiple negative, explaining the success of professional black women, because that is so close to my, my own research. And I actually, I remember reading this article when I was a graduate student and feeling pretty annoyed and rather frustrated by the conclusions that were drawn in the take that the article had. But reflecting on it now, um, with my graduate school years pretty far behind me, I am, I would not say I'm any less frustrated, but I think it's interesting in that it reflects so much of what I think is uh, present about the scholarship about Black women in sociology, right? And, and I will say that I think in looking at it now, I'm probably a little bit more generous to the authors than I would have been then. In that I think what they're trying to do is to make this assessment and understanding of why we do see some successful Black women, given the uh, challenges that so many Black women face and the underrepresentation of Black women in successful fields. Um, but I think that's really reflective, like I said, of how scholarship and their assessment of how we see Black women's success really is very lacking a lot of theoretical and empirical nuance uh, because the focus is on uh, Black women's building self-confidence and their ability to draw from these broader family structures and their ability to uh, make use of kind of community ties to build the independence and belief in themselves that they need to succeed in these occupational spaces. And I find that interesting because I, even in doing research on Black women who are in professional spaces, I still see even in relatively present day, people who will attribute that to Black women's position and ability to succeed in some of these workspaces. When I was doing research for uh, my previous book, No More Invisible Man, one of the things that really struck me was how many Black men would talk about how in interesting ways they were envious of their Black women colleagues, even though they were in these environments, working as doctors, as engineers, as very male-dominated environments where they would talk about their own successes, they would say, you know, I see Black women coming into these spaces and they look out for each other and they're, they've are they got this real bond and they're always checking for each other and they're always making sure that they've got each other's back. And we don't do that as Black men. We don't really know how to. We don't know how to have those conversations or to offer that vulnerability to each other. And that's something that we really find impressive and notable about how Black women are able to succeed. But what that narrative really misses are the things that I heard from so many Black women when I talk with them about their successes. What that misses is the enormous strain of being the one or the two in this environment when it's not always only white men and white women who are not necessarily working to maximize your successes. Sometimes it's other Black men too who aren't necessarily uh, trying to optimize your ability to advance. It doesn't take into consideration the ways that Black women face these enormous boundary or barriers in trying to form relationships with mentors and sponsors who can aid in their occupational mobility. In a book that I'm working on that's coming out later this year, one of the people that I speak to in the project is a well-known Black woman who um, is a journalist. And one of the most poignant parts about her narrative in the book chapter is how she talks about being able to achieve these enormous successes in her field, but the cost that it takes her in terms of her mental health, in terms of the anxiety that she deals with, in terms of the depression that she copes with, when there's this barrage on the internet of just racist and sexist hate coming at her every single day in her emails, through her text messages, and just dealing with that as being a constant part of her job, right? That's the part that we don't talk about in the chapters that don't offer this more nuanced intersectional analysis of thinking about why there are so few Black women who have achieved these uh, lofty heights 
And why just having self-confidence and belief in yourself and the ability to draw from other women in your community who have your back, that's not sufficient if we were talking about these types of structural barriers that are organizational, that are in our labor markets, that are, inst that are institutionalized in so many of our different institutions that get people into those jobs in the first place. Having just <laughs> believing you can do it is not, is, that's just simply not sufficient. And I'm sympathetic to wanting to shine a light on and try to highlight um, the particular attributes that Black women bring into certain jobs as a result of the positionality that they hold, again, because of these intersections of race and gender. But we lose a lot of insights in ways that I think this piece does if we are not also talking about how those insights, how those beliefs and how that strength gets forged in very deleterious circumstances and very difficult obstacles that make that strength something necessary to have in the first place. And so one of the things that I think, and I, I know I'm probably going on longer than you want, so I'll just <laughs> wrap it up quickly by saying one of the things that I do think is a useful way to look at the time, the intervening time period from when this piece was published, looking at that article to what we're looking at now, is that I do think that we have much better theoretical and empirical tools for talking about those types of issues than were present in 1973, right? Black feminist thought, we all know, had not been published at that time period. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw's work had not come out at that time period. Now we are in a better space in sociology to the extent that there is a lot more ample research and theoretical tools and empirical work to build on to make these more nuanced and better arguments. I think it's just a question of when and whether we are poised to actually make those arguments and whether the types of outlets that we have for publishing sociological research are really receptive to making those claims. Great, thank you all so much. And I, I really like the point you ended on too about the outlets that we have. I mean, I think that's a really important thing to think about too. Um, so next up, and this question kind of dovetails nicely with what Margaret was already beginning to talk about, um, but the three of you have all done research in a wide range of different workplace settings. I mean, you talked about your most recent books, but you all have previous books in you know, different types of workplaces. Um, so thinking about the work landscape today, are there types of workers or workplaces that you think need more or maybe even continued attention today? And Margaret, because you already started you know, us off on, on this answer a little bit, I'll turn to you and then maybe Adia and then Christine. Sure, thanks. So I, I still think that, um, well, we need to look at different workplaces, but I'll continue too on, I think, you know, for Asian Americans and looking at the professional workplace, because I think there's not a lot, there hasn't been a lot done. So in particular for Asian American women, we still don't really understand what happens to them. You know, we know that um, in the statistics and in the general um, assessment in these professional workplaces, they don't do as well at all as um, Asian men, white men, and even black women and um, Latino women, right? And part of it has to do with the stereotypes that they actually um, have. You know, they're looked at as demure and acquiescent and sometimes sexualized too. So none of those stereotypes are um, leadership qualities in the professional workplace. So, um, and many times, whatever they do, they're also seen as, if they speak out, they're seen as aggressive like women, but they're also sexualized too. So that also creates um, um, competition sometimes or a lack of sympathy from other women, you know, which makes it really difficult for them to work with um, other women sometimes or find allies in men or other women. So I think we need to explore this more and talk about it more. Um, I think Ellen Powell, when she wrote her book, Reset, um, and she talked about how in the Silicon Valley, or a lot of um, the Asian American women in the Silicon Valley were the first to talk about this in the Me Too movement. And only after they came out speaking about this, then the Asian American women uh, called me back uh, to tell me about their stories in the workplace. So that has to be explored more and has to be pulled apart a little bit more because I think there can be a lot of allyship found among other women and other people supporting them. And I think um, because we don't talk about it, um, people don't know that this is actually going on. Um, so I think that has to continue. Um, and of course, this is true for all of the other uh, groups as well. And um, and because I also studied garment workers before, my first book was on uh, uh, Latino and uh, Asian American uh, garment workers in the New York City um, uh, garment industry in the late 1990s. So I looked at, you know, manufacturing 
Um, I think um, that particular industry is still really important, whatever is left. And in particular, the ones who were unionized. So I'm going to talk about unionized work and service work because that's changed now. We don't, we have very little manufacturing left, but we have lots of service work left. And we have to think about why it's important to look at, you know, or understand what's going on with this unionization movement among Starbucks workers, among um, TAs, you know, among, um, you know, even healthcare, you know, healthcare workers, home healthcare aides, all of this stuff, because a lot of them have women, majority of women in them. And to think about how uh, unionization could affect and maybe bring some kind of equality uh, for women. In, in, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% optimistic, but I feel like those are places where we can see women take leadership maybe. Women did take leadership in the garment industry a long, long time ago when I studied them. But this is an area where I think um, it's still ripe to study to understand what goes on because this is where a lot of women work, you know, especially health, especially in education. You know, these are the places where uh, the service industries um, that's necessary. And we don't have manufacturing. It's, it's, it's the McDonald's now, it's the Starbucks now that I think we need to uh, begin to look at. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to um, Adia, Christine. I think, am I, I think I'm, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, that's okay, yeah, so that that is an interesting question. For me, what's really occupied a lot of my thinking when I think about work in its landscape today is um, really contract workers in all of their iterations and how much, again, probably prompted by flatlining, but thinking about how much work has changed from the models that we took for granted for so long and how much work has become decoupled in some ways from organizations. And what that means for when we think about how to try to have kind of fair and productive and acceptable workplaces. I wrote a piece about this uh, about an aspect of this for the Harvard Business Review uh, earlier this summer, or last summer rather, after uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned, because I remembered being once <laughs> again, as is typical, uh, pretty annoyed by how some organizations were getting a lot of positive buzz about how they were really working to enshrine uh, reproductive rights for their employees and how they were really taking a stand against uh, the Supreme Court's decision to eliminate reproductive choice by making sure that they would pay for their workers if they needed to go out of state or make sure that they were covered if they needed to travel outside of the uh, states where they were housed for, for abortion care. But again, that's that's misleading when we think about the modern workplace and how many people don't actually work for these organizations that are getting this good press and this good buzz. It is misleading when we think about how, again, many women of color, Black and Latina women are underrepresented in the types of jobs where they are directly employed by many of these tech industries in the types of jobs that would enable them to take advantage of this benefit, right? If we were talking about the women who keep Google and Amazon going because they are cleaning the buildings and serving food in the cafeterias, they're not getting this benefit. They're not even <laughs> getting salaries, right? They are not necessarily even getting health care. They are getting to figure out how to pay for their expenses on their own and then come back to work the day of or the next day or, or whenever, right? So these transitions in how we are working, I think, have a lot of implications for how we think about modern workplace, not just modern workplaces, but gender in modern workplaces and what these workplaces are shifting to mean for women and women's options and abilities for work to be a vehicle for economic stability uh, in ways that I would like to, to see more of. I think it's an important question and I think it's critical for us to think about uh, the rise of contract work and the shift of how work is happening to think more critically and insightfully about what that means for women workers. Well, I'm, I agree with, with all of y'all. Um, I want to see three new topics or three things. The first thing I want to know more of, the question was, what do we want to, are there types of workers and workplaces that need more or perhaps continued attention today? I want to know more about people who don't work. Um, and this is kind of related to what Adia was saying. 
Um, I'm not talking about older people who are retired. I'm not talking about younger people who are in school. I'm talking about working age adults who don't work. Something like 40% of working age adults in this country lack paid employment. I want to know some answers to some pretty basic questions about these people. Who are they? What are they doing? How are they surviving? Is anybody thriving? Um, and I want to know how the experience of not working is gendered and racialized. Um, are certain kinds of programs, like we know the unemployment system is highly racialized and gendered. Probably the disability system is too a possibility suggested by my colleague, Ken Hao Lin. Um, I'm also interested in whether sources of economic support differ based on gender and race for people who are working. The second thing that I want to know about kind of takes off from what Margaret was saying. I want to know more about the contradictions of professional employment. There's, there is a great deal of research on professional and managerial women. Probably most of it is about white women. So we need more looking at uh, other uh, groups' experiences. But we have tons of uh, studies of discrimination and sexual harassment, work-family conflict, emotional labor, the glass ceiling. What's missing and what I'd like to hear more about is what are the women actually doing in these jobs, these so-called good jobs? The best jobs in our economy often require women to do, uh, workers, that is, they often require workers uh, to do bad things that harm other people, including harming other women. That's certainly true of the STEM workers that I studied uh, in the oil and gas industry. They spend their time drilling and fracking the earth, contributing to global warming, which we all know has uh, disparate impacts. Uh, women bear the burden of those environmental impacts around the world. Similarly, women in corporate law firms defend polluters and exploiters and harassers. Uh, women who work for Title IX or affirmative action offices are often required to defend their institutions, not the victims of discrimination. I wanna know more about how women manage the dirty business of working in these good jobs. I'm especially interested in how feminists in these positions experience and deal with the contradictions and downsides to successful careers. And then I have a third, <laughs> I have a wish list, my third wish list. I want to know, and I think this is also coming off of what Margaret was saying, um, I want to know more about sexual harassment outside of the standard employment contact, uh, contract. I think that most of what we know about sexual harassment comes from studies of professionals and those who work for large organizations. And again, this is going off of Vidya as well. Um, there's an unfortunate belief out there amongst sociologists that professional women are the ones that are most vulnerable to sexual harassment. I think it's because they're the groups most likely to report it to researchers. Um, so I want to know more about how sexual harassment is experienced by women working in gig employment, agricultural jobs, domestic work. We need more research on how the organizational context enables sexual harassment to occur and how women, especially women marginalized by race, ethnicity, and citizenship, deal with it when it happens. Now, I realize there are feminist sociologists out there that are doing this kind of work already. I just want more of it. Yeah, can I add something? So, you know, when Adia mentioned, um, uh, I guess, gig work or contracting work. So a lot of, you know, the, the service work that I'm talking about, like in the healthcare industry, especially home health aides who are helping out the senior citizens. I mean, we have so many senior citizens now who need home health aides. They're all contractors, you know, and they're all, it's really gig work that they're actually doing. And I think we have to reframe this kind of um, service work to include all of them. And I think for them in particular, uh, some of them, not all of them are unionized. And what does it mean to have that union for them? Um, or sometimes they don't get anything, but sometimes they do. And um, especially health insurance and especially, you know, different kinds of benefits. But I think that, um, by reframing it that way, we actually expand our knowledge of gig work 
Um, and I think it actually includes these women that Christine mentioned, um, because I feel like a lot of them, because they work in these home settings or settings outside of the office, you will see and hear about uh, sexual harassment um, that we don't normally think about, you know, in this gig work. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think, you know, I don't know of anybody who studied it yet, but I think that's definitely necessary. Yeah. So thanks. And hopefully there's some grad students in the audience taking notes about all these wish lists, wish lists of what to study. Um, so next I have a predictions question for you all, which I know is always a little bit unfair, but what predictions do you have about the future of work and how it might affect forms of workplace inequality? And here you may think about remote work, AI, automation, you know, changes we've seen since COVID-19 or other changes that you think might be on the horizon. And so I'll do Adia, Christine and Margaret for this one. Yeah, I'm I'm so curious about remote work. Um, I just think it is going to be such a game changer and we don't quite yet know exactly how or which rules of the game it's going to change. <laughs> but I'm I'm really I'm very intrigued by what that's going to mean again, particularly for underrepresented workers. Um I I don't have uh kind of firm data on this, but just anecdotally, I know that when it comes to Black workers, particularly Black workers who are in professional jobs, there's a lot of support for remote work because there's the idea that you can kind of exempt yourself from some of the racial harassment and bias that uh, I've documented in my work, that other researchers have documented in, in what they have found as well. Um, I think there could potentially be some downsides of that as well as some upsides, but I think we need more work to know for sure what the implications of that are going to be. But I think that remote work is not going anywhere. It's going to be very interesting to see what that means for um, workplace outcomes, particularly pathways into leadership roles and high status positions in, in many organizations. The other thing that I've been thinking about, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, is how workplace, how demographic changes to our workplaces and our labor markets are potentially going to have some implications for collective action and for union organizing or other forms of, of organizing. I'm working, I think Christine is working on this too, the, a piece for work and, work and occupations where they are putting together a special issue where they've asked uh, some people to think about this specifically and whether or not uh, the rise in union organizing is going to have longer term implications or whether it amounts to just kind of a short term individual thing that's happening right now, but, but doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and I, I just, I think, one of the things that I've been really interested in, in addition to these workplace changes, are how we see some shifts occurring with future generations of workers who are really explicit about how, you know, they don't want to follow in the footsteps to some degree of their uh, Gen X and baby boomer peers, and they are adamant that they want more of a work-life balance, and they want to uh, have more opportunities to live their lives and not just be on the grind so, so consistently. Um, there are other early data in coming about millennials interest in uh, diversity and inclusion. I think there's some more work to be done there in terms of what the implications of that are going to be over the short and the long term. Uh, but prediction wise, I don't know that I have any specific ones. It's more so things that I think pretend interesting research questions about where remote work is going to leave underrepresented workers, particularly Black workers, and how demographic shifts in our workplaces, or in our labor force in particular, are, I think, going to have some implications for organizations that are going to have to adjust to the fact that the modal picture that has often been the one that many organizations use of who their workers are simply doesn't match reality, right? And we know that organizations policy-wise have been off from that for a long time. Most organizations and most companies in our economy, I think, aren't built with the mindset that mo that modal families are people or families where both people are working. It's not this model anymore of one man working while one woman stays at home and doesn't do that. That just has been outdated for dec decades and our policies haven't yet caught up. But I think there's also going to be a lot more shifts into what workers want that are going to force organizations to have to grapple with the fact that they are out of date in many ways with what their labor force looks like and wants and, and needs. You are so much more optimistic than I am, Adia. <laughs> um, 
But I must say, uh, when you were talking about the, the new generation, one of my graduate students, uh, uh, Rong Sai, was telling me about the lot, lay flat movement in uh, China and Japan and uh, Taiwan. And you got to look it up, uh, lie flat. It's, it's what the, the new motto is of these millennials. Um, in around the world, and I think uh, increasingly here as well. So um, I'm curious about what will happen to gender inequality when work becomes scarce. I'm actually um, thinking that that might happen, that the robots will take our jobs away. And I'm, I'm interested in knowing what's going to happen to social inequality if and when that does occur. Uh, it's already happening in many uh, places around the world. One estimate I read is that only 30% of the world's working age population has a paid job. Uh, that's 30%. And waged and salaried workers make up only a fraction of those. So work is already scarce in many places around the world. Um, when work becomes scarce here, I wonder who will be better off those with jobs or those without jobs. Um, Alison Pugh is writing a book right now on the last human job. Uh, these are jobs that a robot can't do because they require workers to recognize and care about another person, and they haven't quite quack cracked the code yet on how to do that. Um, as it turns out, this is a requirement of many poorly paid female-dominated jobs. Um, like nursing attendants and childcare workers. In the future, will women be forced into this into these jobs? This is my fear, by the way, not hers. Uh, while every other job is done by computers, uh, I kind of imagine the handmaid's tale, but for the entire economy. Um, if that's the case, then those who are forced to work for a living may be worse off than those who don't have to work at all. So those are my thoughts. So yeah, here's um, a couple for me. So like um, what Adia was just saying about remote work, Asian Americans actually do like it, you know? And so same thing, they don't, you know, with the anti-Asian hate going on, many people don't want to commute to work. You know, they rather just work from home, work in their own community, not go have to return home late at night. And in New York City, that's definitely true because, you know, of the, of the pushing of the woman into the subway and the stabbing incidents and just all the violent, terrible incidents that's, uh, that was happening just last year. So many people, many Asian Americans don't wanna to go to work. They rather work from home. But at the same time, I worry that, you know, what I learned from my book was that the stereotypes that actually hurt them, you know, are those, those stereotypes could actually come back and hit them even harder if they're working away from the office, right? If they're already seen as quiet, not leadership types and they're not hanging out at the water cooler whatever, sharing or networking or, or meeting people who could sponsor or mentor them, you know, in the way that corporations promote people, um, working remote is not going to help at all. You know, they'll hand, they'll hand in the perfect reports. They'll do that working remotely. But the other qualities that are necessary that corporations and leaders are looking for, they won't be able to show it. So I worry that way. So Prediction, I can't tell which way it's gonna go, but I know Asian Americans like it. Uh, they like working remote. The other thing about working remote that I've thought about too is that, um, you know, the kind of work workers that we need, our US corporations, they're actually multinational. They can hire people outside of the US. Anybody can do lots of the work. So that means that there's gonna be a squeeze on employment eventually. Right, if they can hire people for a lot less money, which we know happens all the time, these multinational corporations will do it and do it with no, you know, they're not um, uh, devoted. They're not gonna make sure people get promoted as we all know already. Um, they can easily hire people in way off places and pay them a lot less money as soon as everybody's back, up, back working again, right? So what does that really mean? if we're looking for um, opportunities for people of color, for women, you know, if they're no longer looking for uh, people uh, uh, that they can pay a decent salary to, a good salary to, but they can actually hire uh, um, for a lot less. 
and AI and automation, you know, we've seen that um, in terms of uh, that kind of work in manufacturing. We've lost um, manufacturing work and AI and automation is going after knowledge type work, basic knowledge type work. So as I'm saying that they can hire people um, to code, let's say in countries where they pay a lot less, maybe coders, you don't, you may not need basic coders anymore when you have AI, you know? So that's, I think is the next step. It's going to reach into our knowledge economy too. Um, and then as for COVID, I'm not quite sure yet, but we do know that our offices are all these huge office buildings are half empty now or more. I mean, it's more than that in San Francisco and in the, in the, in, in the Bay Area, in New York right now, I think we're up to 50% of the workers are going back to work. But that means a lot of um, changes for lots of people out there working in all different kinds of, um, of uh, industries. In New York City, we see it in the restaurant workers. Um, we see it in the cabs that take people to work. So it impacts it's all the people downstream if you don't see people working in the offices. So I can't predict, but it's, it's, it's gonna affect a lot of workers, um, a lot of workers in a lot of communities. Um, but you know, our GNP still grows. That means that we can actually pay people more. So maybe people work less, like Christine's talking about this laying flat or quiet quitting or work few hours and maybe people can get paid more. I don't know. I don't know if that would ever happen, but I would like to see that happen because, um, you know, it's actually possible. But not if people want to pocket that money themselves, who are the people at the way, you know, at the very top. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Great. Thank you all. Um, so I have one last question that should be somewhat quick, um, but I do want to remind the audience members that they can start putting their own questions in the chat or in the Q&A box, I apologize, at the bottom. So you should see that little Q&A button and you can start writing down your questions that you have for the panelists. Um, but my last question for this evening is, what do you see as effective policy solutions that could help reduce workplace inequality today? And are there any initiatives that you really wish we would leave behind? Um, so Christine, maybe I'll start with you for this one and then Margaret and then Adia. Sure, thank you. Um, well, the contributors of the uh, special issue of the AJS assume that women's employment would bring about women's equality. Uh, we now have 50 years of research showing that employment does not solve the problem of gender inequality, or in fact, any kind of inequality. So my number one wish is for sociologists to stop thinking that workplaces can solve the problems of social inequality. Um, workplaces are, of course, especially toxic for marginalized groups, people of color, those with disabilities, women with children. According to a recent survey I read, um, almost 20% of workers describe their workplaces as toxic. 20% and 30% experienced harassment, verbal abuse, or physical violence in the workplace in the last year. So, so it's just it's just kind of astonishing to me that anybody thinks that the workplace is going to be the source of gender equality or any kind of equality with, with the more we know, the more we know how impossible work is as a setting to make things better. That said, of course, I have some ideas, uh, some things I like and don't like. Uh, yes to living wages, yes to unions, agree with Margaret there, yes to free childcare and elder care and paid maternity leave, yes to pay transparency, that is, if you're still getting paid by an organization, as Adia points out, uh, yes to corporate accountability for hiring promotions and layoffs, Right now, we have none. Um, I'd also like to see the end to non-disclosure agreements, forced arbitration, and non-compete clauses and employment contracts, although, again, that's getting a smaller and smaller swath of the American worker under its rubric. Um, no to anything. Diversity training? Really? We got to end this sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I can I can understand all that. And um, I think one thing that I think that has helped, though, but I'm afraid we're going to lose it pretty shortly is affirmative action. 
You know, affirmative action, people don't think about it, but it's raised a whole generation, lifted a whole generation up into um, the whatever we have actually in these uh, workplaces. And it's raised a whole generation up through college. Affirmative action has been in, in existence since the late 1970s. So even though people may not admit to ever having affirmative action, the people at the top right now, they probably had it, you know, wherever college they went to. So one thing that I try to remind people, especially my Asian Americans who listen to me talk is that, you know, at Harvard, over 25% of the freshman class is Asian American, over 25% of the university is Asian American. We're not talking about international students on top of that, just Asian Americans. And you don't have that in the corporations because there's very little affirmative action in the corporations. That's the, that's the hypocrisy there. That's why all these people are getting jobs, but they can't move up. But the schools have worked, the schools have worked to increase the numbers of, of uh, African-Americans, Latinos, women, you know, without affirmative action, many women would not have gotten through many of these colleges either. So I, you know, I'm fearful that all of it will be gone. Race will be taken away probably by this new Supreme Court, or not new anymore, but this Supreme Court, uh, maybe in, maybe this month, maybe the like announcement in June, we don't know. But we also know that the, um, the group that is targeting um, affirmative action, getting rid of it, is also targeting corporations. They've already tried to sue um, PepsiCo, PepsiCola, I think, or Coca-Cola, um, Coca-Cola, I think it is, for trying to um, hire uh, law firms that are more diverse. They said, you can't do that, you know, and so they stop. Um, so these diversity programs may go away, but it won't be gone because they don't work, but it's because, you know, they don't want to look at race in these organizations. But the sad part is that you can still, the, the, even though without, we can get rid of these DEI programs, which would be good because we know they don't work by training, but what would be awful is that you can't count people. You can't do audits anymore to actually count because you're looking at people race consciously. So that's the sad part about it. So maybe in the corporations, they can still maintain it because they're private. I don't know, but we shall see. But there are other um, programs like expanding pipeline programs that I hope to see um, that can um, increase uh, the numbers of people in these organizations and increase pipeline programs where they train executives or train people in an industry instead you know, instead of just in one corporation. That way, when people leave one corporation, they can go to another. And that's tied to this non-disclosure too. Um, non yeah, non-disclosure. So I'll stop there, I'll let Adia continue. Thank you, yes. So if you'll indulge my uh, getting on a soapbox for a minute, <laughs> it just infuriates me to my core that we live in a country that has no paid parental leave. Like just the fact that that's a reality drives me completely bonkers on so many levels because it's so basic to what we're talking about but it's also just basic on a humane level not to expect people to return to work shortly after having had a baby that just is nonsensical it's ridiculous that there isn't a policy in place to protect families and to protect people who have and to, not even just solely to protect people who have had children or who are new parents but to protect people who are parents period i just find that incredibly frustrating as a <laughs> as an American citizen that that's a real thing that hasn't seen substantial progress and been able to to change uh over time so that is a policy that I'd very much like to see implemented um not least because it just irks me so much that that isn't a reality uh in America in 2023. The other policy that I think data are starting to indicate would actually have a pretty significant impact on reducing inequality would be universal basic income. Uh, and there may be data out there that I haven't seen, but from the preliminary work that I have looked at, the localities and cities that have actually tried to implement this have seen marked, pronounced positive uh, results. 
Uh, and I have to say that I think a lot of the backlash towards univers universal basic income uh, comes from assumptions about who would receive it and what they would do with it and which type of people should and should not be benefiting from uh, government policy in ways that really undermine everybody and are not good for, for all of us. I just It reminds me of um, Jonathan Metzl's really interesting work when he talks about uh, certain ways that some voting decisions really cut off people's noses to spite their own faces, given that these voting decisions and policy prescriptions really would be a benefit to people who aren't supporting them because they have decided to prior prioritize uh, other issues that they would rather support that aren't working out for them well in the long term. So I'd like to see universal basic income. I would like to really see paid parental leave become things that happen in the U.S. that we just take for granted. In terms of things that I think we can let go of, I will have to side very emphatically with Christine that it's time to shut the door on diversity trainings. <laughs> there's just so much data and there's so much evidence. This, this, this is not it. It's not getting the job done. It's not working. It's not doing what it needs to do. And we know that. And yet here we are still doing it and still mandating it in so many companies to no avail and getting the same lack of results that it's been getting for, again, for decades now. Um, I think the final thing I would say for people who are interested in thinking more about uh, diversity writ large in organizations, I would point people to uh, Frank Dobbin and Sandra Caleb's recent book, Getting to Diversity, where they actually document strategies that are evidence-based and do work in creating more diverse organizations. And they base this on spending a lot of time with HR managers, really combing through data very carefully and documenting what does work and what does not work. And spoiler alert, again, diversity training <laughs> is not on the what works list, but they have a really uh, useful uh, synopsis and really detailed chapters that spell out what works and why it works and where it works and so forth. And so for people who want to dig into this a little bit more, I think their book is a great place to start. Great. Thank you all so much for answering my questions. We are now going to turn it over to some audience questions, and we're we're getting a bunch of them in, in the Q&A here. So the panelists, you should be able to see the questions from the audience, but I will also read them out loud for everybody. Um, so I thought I would start us off actually with a question that um, seems to be coming from an undergraduate student, which says, for women who face all these systematic racism and sexism on a daily basis, what is the best strategy to resist these oppressions on an individual level? I'm an undergrad here, and I think everything we've been talking about is incredibly important, but I fear that when I start working, I will not be able to talk about these topics with my colleagues or friends who do not share the same concerns. I'm wondering what are the things people like me can do? So would anyone, any of our panelists like to start us off with some, some solutions here? I mean, I think, uh, I'll say, I think talking to a group of sociologists and asking this question, you're <laughs> probably going to get an answer that doesn't emphasize individual solutions, but I, I think that's that's by design. I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to being in a situation where you're not sure what you can do as one person to try to address and resolve these issues or to deal with these challenges. But I think a lot of that is because you shouldn't be trying to deal with these issues as one person. These aren't individual problems or issues or challenges that we're talking about. These are things that occur at the systemic level, at the organizational level, and that is where the changes need to happen. So I don't totally feel comfortable saying uh, you know, well, you can do this and you can you can do this thing independently and you can do that thing independently. I would really push more towards trying to see how you and a collective of workers can make your organizations change and to reflect some of the things that we are talking about. Just because I think if your approach is more so, uh, you know, how can I get the organization to do these things differently? How can I respond to what's happening in the organization? That just leads to burnout. It's going to stress you out. It's just going to be so taxing and so draining and so tiresome. But I think if there are ways to think collectively about how you and other workers can push your organization to be one that does offer some type of leave, to be one that doesn't do these needless diversity trainings, to be one that does offer work arrangements that take into consideration varied people's needs, to be one that does stand really firm on making sure that harassment and bias towards underrepresented workers is unacceptable. It just, I, I think there would be a lot less of the strain and stress that comes along with trying to do that individually, and I think it would be more effective. 
Any other thoughts from other panelists or would you like me to move on to our next question? So sure. you know, until they, you know, a lot of the organizations, um, they may not have, um, they have DEI as we talked about, but, uh, but they, some of them actually have what they call employee resource groups and they do different things. So when you're a new employee, you may go to them and find a collective body because sometimes they do different uh, things in challenging the organization. Sometimes they bring in different talks. Sometimes they do basic cultural things, but that is a way to start to find a collective. Um, sometimes they'll do things with other, what they call employee research groups of different people of different backgrounds or women or the um, LBGT uh, Q group or you know variety but that is one way where you can find some people that may share a common ground with you so something to just kind of know that you, they are there so i'll ask your next question coming from joya who asks uh, or who says where idea ended was kind of um, what i kept thinking about i like to believe that sociologists have learned things that help us make progress what are our best bets for structural changes we can make that really help address gender and racial inequalities in the workplace? Can we ask Joya to unmute herself? <laughs> Joya, you know the answer to these more than we do, yeah. come on. I would love to, I don't know if, if, if I'm capable of that, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately I don't think we can, so. Oh, all right, well, let me think, what would Joya say? Doya, as a group uh, dedicated to thinking about public policy issues globally and figuring out how policies uh, make a difference around the world and whether they can be imported and what are the barriers, cultural and otherwise, to such importation. So, I mean, this is exactly where I think a lot of good research is happening you know, I'm I'm just so pessimistic these days. I just I just don't think that the workplace is either long for this world, number one, or to be relied upon to solve these fundamental problems that impact every one of our social institutions. So our next question: What do we know about LGBTQ plus workers and trans and gender non-confirming workers? Well, now we can ask Kristen to unmute herself. <laughs> Kristen, are you willing? Um, sure. I mean, I would say we like don't know. I mean, we know mostly about people in professional jobs, um, which is you know very similar. We know mostly about white LGBTQ people. We know more about gay and lesbian people than we do about bisexual, trans, you know, non-binary folks, um, and we don't have great you know statistics in terms of um, outcomes, right? I mean, I think it's been the the kinds of ways that we might study this as sociologists using statistics. We don't tend to get data on gender identity um, and, you know, sexual identity. And so it's been hard to kind of look at that. But I mean, the, the research that does exist suggests, you know, particularly for a lot of trans people that they are in low paying retail service jobs and are very vulnerable to losing their jobs or face an inability to get jobs even, right? So we're working in the informal economy, particularly for trans women, um, particularly for trans women of color who are young. Um, and so I think there's a lot of room for more work to be done in that area. Like there was kind of a boom in the early 2000s and then it sort of died out again. Um, and so we just don't know a lot um, systemically in terms of like what kinds of career paths. Like I think M. Lee Badgett does a little bit of that in economics, but you know, I think it's always one of those things that you wanna do an update on because we just don't have, um, you know, it's, it's such an important topic, but we don't have a lot of information on it. Great. So we have two questions in the chat specifically for Margaret. So I think we could do those next. Um, so one says, as an Asian, I have to go over to the answer questions. Um, as an Asian living in America, I think many Asian Americans before they reach the workplace are told that they're quiet, unsocial, even when they're not socialized to think that they are unfit for executive roles. How do we make a change to fix this problem? 
And the second asks, could you go into more details about why Asians seem to be um, able to get into schools but can't seem to make it high up on the corporate ladder? So if you have any thoughts on, on those two questions. Yeah, so in my in my research, I found that all of my Asian Americans, no matter where they're from, they actually have this verbal uh, playbook. I call it the Asian American playbook, and it's strictly American, right? So because they talk about um, their parents, they all share this verbally, their parents and neighbors and people who've gotten into college, they all share this advice book that basically says, you know, do well in school, become a leader of a club or something in your school and um, do some extra stuff that shows that you're a caring person, basically. I mean, do these things to show that you're good. So obviously these things are particular for the Asian American school system, because in Asia, we know they only focus on test grades, but here in the US, you need to do all these things in particular too, extracurricular activities and, and in addition to um, being you know, good in school. So that playbook does everybody well until they get into the workplace. Because in the beginning of, um, at any job, um, what matters is that you perform uh, what your manager tells you to do, right? So you end up doing well in your PowerPoint, you end up doing well in your presentations. But then when you get to a certain level, people don't see more than what you are, okay? So that playbook also doesn't explain that in a corporation, it's an organizational, there's organizational structure there. Maybe you are in a part of the organization, such as the back room where you can actually be promoted to be a manager, even though you want to be. People don't explain to you that maybe it's a good idea to be in an executive training program so that you can be exposed to other people in the corporation. That playbook also doesn't explain to you that the organization may actually look, may actually be racist and may actually try to reinforce the stereotype on you and just say that, no, no, you're, you're just not leadership quality. You're just too quiet. So all of these things, people don't realize that's going on and nobody's there to actually tell them, you know, because even throughout this whole 40, 50 years of Asian Americans um, getting into college and moving into these workplaces, there are very few at the top who can actually explain this to people. So that's why, you know, that exists. You know, if there are people out there who can explain this, who can talk about this more in forums like this, people would actually get it, okay? So I think that, and what can you do about it? I think you have to kind of meet other people who believe that, oh, there may be something actually wrong going on out there. That how can I, as a South Asian, also face the same kinds of uh, uh, racism that other people from um, East Asia face? And you'll get to see that. And what I learned is that in giving talks to corporations, even though I interviewed all um, Asian Americans, people born here and people who are 1.5, that is they came here when they were 13 or younger, these qualities that I am explaining to you actually affect um, immigrants who come here who are a lot older too. So it's uh, structural in many, many ways. So um, I see here, um, oh, experiences of Asian Americans growing up in in, um, in a white privileged family. I, I don't, but I know that people do write about um, Asian Americans who are um, adopted. Thank you. Great, thanks Margaret for answering those specific questions. And I think we're gonna turn it over to Kristen who has a question too. It's muted. I know. I thought I would figure that out by now. Um, so we're almost at time. So I thought I would take the opportunity to ask the last question. Um, so I, you know, am somebody who I think is probably as pessimistic as Christine is in many ways. That's why we like each other, I think. Um, but, you know, I've been really interested in this idea of quiet quitting, um, which Margaret and Christine referenced. Um, and you know this idea of the great resignation, right? Um, and the thing that really I think about it a lot when I think about it is, um, you know, it's not really people at the top who are in part of the great resignation, right? I mean, it's like the kind of powers that be. I mean, Pew just did a big study on who's actually re resigning and why, and you know, it's certainly not CEOs of companies, right? Um, and 
you know, I was thinking a lot about like this idea of, you know, Gen Z wanting more work family balance and things like that. But the thing that concerns me as a sociologist, just even looking at our discipline, is those desires are really spread differently across even the same generation. And so if you look at the discipline of sociology, right, there's a recent article that in the last 25 years, publishing demands for grad students have tripled in our discipline, um, you know, which is us, right? I mean, it's not the same in history. It's not the same in anthropology, like it specifically is something in sociology. And, you know, during the pandemic, you really saw this divide between people who were like, I can't get any writing done, you know, I'm having a really hard time. And people who are like, I just wrote 15 articles while the pandemic was happening. And, you know, unfortunately, like those still fall in very traditional patterns that we would see, right? That there's, um, we see more women and people of color, you know, in part of the great resignation than we do white men. And, you know, I'm curious about what do you do when the desire for work family balance or to take these policies or to have like a more humane life aren't evenly spread across a population? Um, because that to me seems like it's just going to end up reproducing what we've had for a long time. I was just rereading the Communist Manifesto for another reason, but um, I uh, uh, I came across this great line where Marx talks about how uh, the titans of industry, the bourgeoisie, don't work. Workers work, um, and and it just got me to thinking. It's like. Yeah, you said, well, you know, the CEOs aren't doing the great resignation. I think they are. I mean, I, I think they get, you know, turned out and then they they have their little islands that they bought and, and they're having a good time. Uh, they're not working hard. Uh, it's, you know, the gig workers. It's all the people who are making the fortunes for them that are working very hard. And, you know, the great resignation is all well and good, but that goes back to my original question. I mean... Who are these non-workers? What is enabling people to not work? If 40% if of working age Americans are not working, what the heck are they doing? And how are, how are those experiences of non-work uh, stratified? I mean, are, I mean, just like at work, I mean, most people are suffering and a few of us are thriving uh, in our jobs. I'm sure the same is true with the not working population, that there's several people who are struggling, and those tend to be the focus of our sociology, rightfully so, but there's going to be some people who are thriving, and they're not working, and I want to know who they are, and I want to know if they're men, and I want to know if they're white, and I want to know what we're doing as a society to enable them to not work, um, to get out of the grind that is increasingly characterizing the jobs that are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to um, add to that, because I think what, what's going on is that there's a divide in every single one of these industries of the haves and the half nots, right? And I think that's what Christine was trying to get at. It's like, I think the people who have wealth saved away, have money saved away, have the, you know, another parent who can help at home, you know, um, are the ones who are not working or are the ones who are not working as hard, right? So, because I think it's very difficult to survive in our survive in our society if you don't have any of that, if you don't have basic income, if you don't have, you know, basic childcare. Like that's how I think. Like during COVID, you saw all these women leave their jobs, but they had to leave their jobs because the kids were at home, and they were not better off afterwards. You know, but but they had to come home to take care of the kids while the kids were trying to use Zoom. You know, but the people who did were able, the women who were able to work, you know, they had a babysitter or somebody else at home with their kid while they were doing Zoom, you know? So that's, I think innately, this will really um, kind of show where the divide is and really empty out the middle. You know, you're really gonna have people who have nothing and have people who are, have all the advantages, have everything. You know, so that's just an idea. I don't know if it's true. I haven't done any research on it. It's just an idea. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Christine brings up uh, Marx. I, I teach our graduate and undergraduate theory classes here. So I end up revisiting Marx pretty much each semester that I that I teach that class. One of the 
things that's relevant to this discussion that's in his work that's interesting that I think often gets overlooked is that when people think about Marx, lay people often, you know, they think he's this, you know, angry communist and he hates work, he hates, you know, hates everything and hates work and workers, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at his work, that's, you know, that's not what he actually said. When he talks about the concept of the species being, he's talking about this idea that there's this real innate satisfaction that people can and under normal circumstances would take in work, right? That there's this very human element to want to impact your surroundings and to want to do something that's productive and that is valuable and that they're good at and that can be recognized. But in his argument, a big part of what he is suggesting is that that natural inclination gets perverted by a capitalist system that, as we know from his claims, exploits the proletariat and leaves all of the surplus to the bourgeoisie while the proletariat have to subsist only on, have to live only on the subsistence wages that they have, right? And I think that's relevant to what we're talking about here because even if we're talking about uh, kind of who's working and who's not working and what it means to not work and what some groups, what, what, what characteristics we can ascribe and identify for which groups are or are not working, I don't think that work itself is the the problem, right? I think I, I do agree with, I think that Marxist argument that there is a natural human desire to want to do something and to want to express yourself in, in, in some way. But I think we also work, <laughs> we live and work and operate under a structure and a system that makes it so difficult for most people to find valuable, productive ways to, to do that. So what are ways to think more broadly about how work as it's construed could change, inclusive of not actually working, given how uh, how bad, I was thinking of a different word, but I won't use it since we're being recorded, <laughs> but given how badly the system, <laughs> uh, social and economic systems have distorted work into the way that it is today, right? So, I guess I just I think that the questions that we have been raising about who is and isn't who is and who is not working are really valuable and valid and interesting and important questions. But I guess I want to reiterate that to me, those still seem like systemic questions about where at, where as sociologists, we can identify the structures that have made that have made work go wrong rather rather than thinking about work as inherently being something that has to be as bad as it is for so many people. It doesn't have to be like, it's it's this way because structures have made it this way. It could be better because it doesn't have to be this bad. I think the questions for how to make it better are empirical ones that we can ask to make it not be so awful. That's wonderful, thank you. Well, we are at time. So I wanna thank you all for spending your um, evening with us. And thank you so much, Sigrid, for being such a fantastic moderator. And thank you to the audience, but this was really a joy. So thank you so much for joining us.